Um, I thought I'd start off just by giving an introductory lecture, just, I mean, just tell you a little bit more about myself and where I come from. Um, a lot of the views that I'm going to express and some of the ideas are pretty unconventional. And um, in the day and age of, uh, you know, um, false information and um, conspiracy theories, I think, you know, you really need to understand where the information is coming from and, and then really make a judgment for yourself. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to be presenting is going to be quite detailed and I realize that many people it's going to go over your head and you're not going to understand all the detail. The purpose of providing such detailed biochemistry and, and physiology is not to try, you know, have you remember all of that stuff. It is merely to try and put forward an argument as to why we have certain views. I always say that, you know, um, particularly, I mean, one of the topics, nutrition of carnivores is very simple. Um, you know, they eat other animals. And when you want to feed them in a zoo situation, you simply have to replicate what they eat out in the wild. That sounds very simple and it's straightforward, but when you're trying to do that in a, um, a zoo context when you don't have those other wild animals available to just simply kill and provide you know, as food for them, then you've got to come up with something that's going to approximate what they eat in the wild, and that actually becomes very, very difficult to do. Okay, certainly in terms of cost, that's a big problem, but then in, in just having the animals available. Uh, so, for example, in cheetahs, I always say that the ideal food for cheetahs would be just goats, I mean, as a domestic animal, because that approximates what they would eat pretty much in the wild. But if you consider that a cheetah would probably eat about a goat per week, okay, that turns out to be about 52 goats per year. And if you've got 30 cheetahs at a facility, that becomes an enormously large, you have, a go have to have a goat farm in order to be able to provide the food for the cheetahs. So <clears throat> it becomes a, an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, I, always, I have another lecture that I give to my uh, students, which is why meat is bad for carnivores. Um, and again, it's just a bit of a play on the word. We'll discuss that in detail. And if you go home with one message now, it's that muscle meat, meat, okay, steak, this idea, you know, with Madagascar, the, the movie, you have the lion chasing the zebra with this big steak um, in its mind. And, and yes, they do like the muscle meat, but uh, the, the take-home message is, is that they don't eat meat, they eat carcasses. So they eat all the other components. And when you start looking at what is in those components, then uh, it becomes really actually very, very complex. And um, you're going to talk very broadly. I, I, I you know, um, in, in terms of nutrition, you, we don't have to stick to carnivores. I'm going to do a little bit of a presentation on some great apes. I, I know you guys have got some great apes. Um, and, uh, you know, so feel free to, uh, I probably don't know a huge amount about herbivores, as, or even though I do lecture, provide some lectures on that even at the university. So um, in terms of, of animals, um, yeah, I probably can't help you too much with the kangaroos and so on. But, um, but uh, you know, have a fairly broad knowledge base, um, having worked in a zoo myself, and, mm -hmm. and had to look up, you know, make sure that I understand nutrition on a very broad uh, scale. And then also, you know, lots of other areas of, of interest, as I'll kind of show you that. Um, so if you've got any other questions, I would prefer that it's not completely a formal kind of lecture, but that we have a bit of an interaction. So if you've got a question, please pop up your hand and just ask. Um, and so there are no stupid questions, really. Uh, anything, anything goes, you know, so just um, let me know. All right, so um, I'm Adrian Tordiff. I'm based at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Um, where uh, I teach mainly pharmacology for my sins. I, I don't, it's not my favorite subject, but um, it's been something that I've been involved in. And when you, I, I've been involved in anesthesia of um, wildlife for a long time, and obviously in terms of anesthesia, anesthesia and pharmacology are very closely linked uh, in understanding the drugs um, that we use and how they move through the body, uh, how they you know, metabolized and so on. And um, so I still teach that at an undergraduate and postgraduate course, and most of my re research is really not um, in pharmacology. Okay, but I started off um, after I qualified in 1997, went over to the UK, and I did uh, worked in two uh, small animal clinics, uh, initially up in Manchester, um, where I ran a, a surgery kind of on my own. I always tell my students that, that are interested in doing wildlife work that it's really good to go and work in um, small animals, 
and get some basic skills. Many of our um, wildlife veterinarians, young wildlife veterinarians in South Africa, we, we call them dart jockeys because they really, you know, that's, that's all they really can do is, you know, they can dart a, an impala at 70 meters, um, no problem, and they're very, very efficient, but they really are good technicians. Um, and, and when they're presented with an animal that has got some kind of problem, then they're stumped, then they don't know what to do, you know. So, um, because they don't have the basic skills uh, in terms of diagnostics, surgery, things like that, that you learn in, in small animal practice when you're working with a high number of, of animals. Um, so, uh, I was fortunate to get that kind of experience, but um, after eight years in small animal practice, I was kind of um, bored with that um, and really needed some new challenges. So, I went back to South Africa and did my master's degree um, in African mammalogy at the Mammal Research Institute, University of Pretoria, and then worked on a project in wild dogs, um, which looking for a, a particular bacteria called Bartonella. Uh, it turned out to be a bit of a trying to find a needle in the haystack and actually didn't find it in, in, in the wild dogs, found it in a few other species. Um, but it was a, a great learning um, experience, that. And then immediately after that, uh, I managed to get a position at the National Zoo uh, in Pretoria. Um, whole different experience. Hadn't worked on sort of um, herbivores or ruminants and had to rethink a um, whole bunch of stuff. But um, wide range of species suddenly. Interestingly, the first um, animal that I ever darted uh, in was uh, was a cheetah. So uh, at that stage, had no real idea that I would actually be working on cheetahs um, in as much detail as I ended up. But uh, it was a, a really good experience. And one of the first patients that I actually um, got to work on, again, uh, ended up being a, an indirectly a nutritional issue. Um, but I think it will hopefully it was a Hopefully this plays, I'm not sure if it will. A gorilla called um, Hobbit. And Hobbit uh, was a 30-year-old. He had type 2 diabetes. And by the time I, you know, within the first week of having worked at the, the zoo, and I diagnosed him with type 2 diabetes and he was already ketoacidotic. So he urgently needed doses of insulin and he had never been trained for anything. I mean, so there was very little um, behavioral training. And I'll tell you the story now once you've finished watching. This was day two, the second ever insulin injection that he ever got uh, by hand, I would say. Still didn't like me very much still. Yeah. <laughs> so this was a very interesting case. Um, because, hopefully not going to play again, no, okay, so it was a very interesting case because now you have an animal, okay, that uh, suddenly has a disease in which he needs some sort of treatment. The first, uh, after diagnosing him, um, I then darted him with insulin, uh, and we initially were starting on twice daily and then moved over to insulin glargine, which we could give once a day. But after the second time of darting, and I mean, you know, you've darted gorillas before, it's an it's a absolute nightmare. I mean, they, they hate it. Um, you're lucky enough not to have feces thrown at you, you know, screaming, all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, darting a gorilla every single day you know, with insulin is not really going to be uh, viable. And I actually had decided that I would euthanize him if, if I didn't get to actually hand injecting him. Now, he had not been trained at all. There was no time to train him, really, you know, um, and darting him every day was not going to be conducive to training him at the same time. He's going to hate everybody if that happens. So I walked up there thinking, okay, well, either you're going to sit for this injection or you're going to be euthanized. So, and uh, this was the second time that I, I went in, hand injected him. He sat with the, against the bars and I just injected him. Um, and then I thought, well, that was lucky. You know, probably not going to happen again. <laughs> Walked up the next day, and this was the next day. That's what he what he did. Came over, tapped his shoulder, put his shoulder against the bars. I never taught him to do that. He never experienced it before, and then bang. He um, carried on doing that for three years. Uh, actually got to the next stage where that was a bit unsafe, sticking your hands right through the bars and having a 200-kilogram gorilla you know, potentially bash your, uh, your hand. Um, so we train him kind of to sit... Um, with his back against the bars. So this was kind of 
I think probably a few months later. And then he likes uh, eggs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what, what is amazing about this case is just that this animal was able to somehow perceive, and that's the only explanation I have at this stage, perceive that whatever I was giving him was going to make him feel better or make him better. Um, so the intelligence of these animals just stuns me at some stage, and you know, um, because there's all every good reason for him to absolutely not do what I wanted him to do. Um, anyway, so that was the first um, sort of major non-infectious and uh, disease that I'd kind of dealt with. It certainly was an area of interest of mine. So I've gone on to then look at a whole range of, of animals. And in zoos, we notice that infectious diseases, whilst they are you know potentially a problem, they really are not the major cause of problems. Most of our issues in zoos relate to non-infectious diseases, most of them due to nutrition. Um, so when you're working in a zoo environment, really a knowledge of, of the basics of nutrition is you know, critically important because uh, many of those diseases are related to that. This was just a giraffe, the first giraffe I ever darted to. Uh, again, also an interesting experience because as soon as we darted the animal, when it went down, it went up on its back legs and fell over backwards. And you can see this is inside a stall inside onto a concrete floor. And I was convinced that this head, the head of the giraffe was going to be completely split open because the noise of this whipped neck and head, head hitting the floor um, was absolutely uh, breathtaking. And um, but when I got to the giraffe, his head was absolutely still in one piece, except that it wasn't breathing. Um, we used a, a, a etorphine at the time, um, which giraffe are very sensitive to. But anyway, managed to reverse that, kept him down on ketamine. This was a giraffe that had asthma, again, a non-infectious disease. And um, what they you know, called COPD or uh, other names for it now, I think in horses now they just refer to it as asthma. Um, so, interesting because how do you get a sample from the lungs of a giraffe? I mean, so we did a transtracheal uh, aspirate, so made a right down on the bottom over here, um, and managed to do flush some fluid into the actual lungs and retrieve some fluids and make the diagnosis. Uh, unfortunately for this giraffe, I mean, the problem trying to treat a one ton, uh, well, it's over, it was over a ton, um, giraffe with uh, prednisolone every day or try and use any sort of um, Inhalants would be almost impossible, and we ended up euthanizing him in the end. But uh, again, an interesting one. And then on to elephants. Uh, we had an unfortunate problem. This is an infectious disease. Um, had a problem with tuberculosis. Uh, elephants are very, very sensitive to human tuberculosis. And in, in Africa, and obviously southern Africa, we have a high proportion of our visitors that enter the zoo carrying uh, human tuberculosis. And um, it seems that even just a single exposure to it in elephants can um, give them the actual infection and then it, it may develop over many, many years until they actually die of their condition. And um, so this, this elephant over here that I've just uh, darted um, was an elephant that did have TB. And then I had to get into the cycle of actually um, anesthetizing again. We had a situation where none of our animals were trained for any medical procedures, even our elephants. Um, not much I could do about that. Uh, so if we wanted to examine them, wanted to get samples from them, uh, they weren't trained for trunk washes or anything like that, we would have to immobilize them. And so very quickly, every six months, I was immobilizing all of our elephants uh, in a very confined space. And as that turns out, it's quite a tricky si situation to be in. Um, this was, uh, so in a confined space, what can sometimes happen is that the animal backs itself up into a corner, gets its bum in the corner, and then becomes actually a real, you know, got to make a call as to whether you're going to wake it up again and reverse the anesthetic or whether you're going to try and push through. Um, and this is one of those tricky situations that we had uh, where this female elephant, she's now quite heavily sedated already by the tranquilizing drugs, backed up in the corner, got herself very neatly positioned over there. Uh, and this is quite a worrying situation. Okay. So it's actually quite a lot more difficult in the zoo situation to try and anesthetize an elephant than out in the wild where they just go and fall down in the middle of a grassland or a woodland. Okay, you only have to worry about occasional trees that they... And then as you will realize very quickly that a you know, three-ton elephant is almost impossible to move. Um, we tried a few things here. 
and you'll see it gets more and more um, comical <laughs> as we try a few things. Once they, once they decide they're not going anywhere, they're not definitely not going anywhere. Unless you've got some sort of heavy lifting equipment or a TLB or something like that, yeah, no amount of manpower is going to shift them at all. But when you're young and naive, you just try anything. <laughs> yeah. And you've got to try and problem solve. I mean, and this, this was um, what I guess makes this interesting um, kind of work. Is that you didn't anticipate this, but yeah, as I said, no amount of, and we eventually get more and more people on the end of that rope, and it <laughs> <laughs> still didn't work. <laughs> okay, so then you think, okay, well, now we're going to either reverse or we're going to carry on and decide, okay, well, let's be brave and carry on. Give her a top up um, intravenously. Fortunately, she's um, sedated enough to, to give an extra dose. But now things are getting really bad uh, because this elephant's going down. The weight of the abdomen is now pushing on the diaphragm, pushing, crushing her lungs. And even worse, you know, the trunk is, going, is being folded, which is the only way of breathing is through the actual trunk. Um, and now I need to get that back leg uh, stuck, uh, unstuck from there. And as I said, as you see, you know, very little, even just bending a knee can be quite a, a challenge with everybody on the rope. Fortunately, I had a very good uh, vet tech um, who is quick. Whilst I'm focusing on this, she's, she knows to be able to move the trunk and get it into a position so the elephant can carry on breathing, even though it's quite difficult. Yeah, as you can see, it's... <laughs> And eventually we managed to get her onto her side and into a much better position um, and then carried on with the procedure. Anyway, <laughs> so some challenging things, but um, that then led to having done a bit of experience on that. We went over to China. Um, our good friend, Karat Stienkamp, who's a veterinary dentist, a specialist who does a lot of wildlife veterinary dentistry and has, is probably now the, the world's best um, dentist in, in terms of elephants and does a lot of tusk uh, work, fractured tusks. Um, so we went off to China uh, for a, a tusk procedure. That was an inter interesting experience because it wasn't just the elephant that we ended up looking at. That was the tusk. We did a partial uh, pulpectomy on the, on the tusk of that elephant. Again, this is a fractured tusk. Um, and if you get in there pretty early, then you can actually uh, remove part of the pulp and then plug it back up and seal it up. And um, they do very, very well. If the whole tusk gets infected, then you end up with a situation where you've got to do an extraction, which is not an easy procedure. But whilst we were there, we ended up working, doing a little bit of work on, they had, had some zebras as well. They had three stallions and a mare in the same enclosure, which was really interesting because they were kicking the hell out of each other. And then had a nice big hematoma on the leg that we had to uh, deal with. You see that dental problems um, are a big issue, uh, bears. Carnivores, fractures of the, the teeth, canines, um, a really big problem. And then even got to see um, this uh, walrus. You can see it's already got capped uh, tusks, again, because they haul themselves out normally in, on the ice. But in this situation, out onto concrete um, in the enclosure. And, of course, that just breaks or wears down the actual tusks. And then they, once they're exposed and, and the, the root canals are exposed, you get infections that then cause abscesses. Okay, quite a sad s story, yeah. Unfortunately, we never we were planning to go back or hoping to go back to be able to, to work on that walrus, but um, China is a bit of an interesting place, and we never really got an invitation to go back. Also, did quite a lot of work um, in Giza in, in Egypt, where uh, led a delegation of, of uh, vets and um, zookeepers to go and try and help with an intervention there. Giza was in, in quite a bad state at one stage. Uh, they had over 40 lions with only space for probably eight. And um, so help them with some vasectomies on their males. But again, it's a very difficult environment to work in. Um, and um, yeah, 
did some hippo work there as well. They had quite a number of hippos uh, that also had some dental issues and anesthetizing hippos is quite an interesting thing. Uh, and then we did some uh, vasectomies on elephants in South Africa. At one stage, we were looking at various different contraceptive options in elephants. And this was one of them um, that the, was proposed by a group of Americans uh, from Colorado. And um, uh, we did some surgery on them. Okay, we, don't, we no longer do the vasectomies on elephants. We've got a much more effective way of uh, using a PZP, a uh, porcine zona pellucida vaccine on them uh, for contraceptive and works very, very well. So we have small populations of elephants around South Africa that really do need to be controlled, otherwise they devastate the environment and they're on fairly small reserves, you know, it's not big open spaces where they can migrate and so on. Um, but anyway, this, this was very interesting because again, elephants uh, don't have, uh, they've got internal testes they're inside the abdomen. So if you're going to do any vasectomy, you actually have to go inside the abdomen. And of course, in a wild setting, that's not so easy to do. So what we end up doing is uh, we have this technique where we suspend the elephant, that the elephant's immobilized, Suspended by a crane, we bring two vehicles up on either side uh, um, and stand on the back of the vehicles and then do surgery on either side, laparoscopic surgery. Um, one team will open up the one side whilst the other uh, working on the other side and then we'll swap over. So it was, it was a great experience to get involved in that. It's also where I met Jeff Zuber from San Diego Zoo and um, his uh, equipment where he used positive pressure ventilation of elephants, which is something I've been using for many years after that. Um, that machine over there called the Zubinator, all right, it's something that um, I've used a, a great deal. And Jeff is retired now, um, but him and I still talk quite a, a lot around um, elephant anesthesia. And then, yeah, I also got to be involved in some of the surgery. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we mentioned some tusk surgery. Uh, Gerrit Steenkamp and I have been to Poland. This is probably our biggest case. Um, uh, five and a half ton African elephant with a massive uh, fractured uh, tooth. We've been back to Poland four times now for this elephant. We eventually extracted both tusks on, on this elephant. Um, but this was really where we, we kind of uh, mastered this technique. Um, from my side, the anesthesia and analgesia of the, this animal. So managing the pain of such a massive procedure, um, as well as keeping that animal down for up to four hours and then ensuring that the, the elephant gets up afterwards. Uh, which is quite, quite a challenge. But I think we've, we've got to this space now. Earlier in the year, we were invited to Alabama, um, to Birmingham Zoo over there, where we did a tusk extraction in just under three and a half hours, similar sized elephant. Um, so it was very gratifying to get um, very you know, uh, good at this technique. Um, obviously, I always said to Karate, you know, should probably think about being a gynecologist rather than a, <laughs> with the way that he has to work very you know, deep inside an animal. I mean, obviously lots of blood and, and gore, but um, compared to the amount of total body blood reserve in this animal, five or so liters of blood, really not, not that much um, to worry about. Okay, and that was Nino, the, the elephant from, um, from Poland. And now sometimes can be quite a challenge getting him down into positions. Um, so, and there's Karat working on him. And also did some work here in Australia on some Asian elephants. So at Taronga Zoo, we did do a bilateral tusk extraction on a young um, Asian elephant bull uh, quite a few years ago. And then in Melbourne, uh, we did the same, well, same procedure, um, just in two, two procedures, uh, also on an Asian um, elephant. Can, can elephants regurgitate when they lose the tires? They do, they can, but it's very rare that we really see any sort of problems with regurgitation in them. So um, not, not a particular problem. Uh, we, in, in Africa, when we you know, anesthetize them in the wild, we try and do them early in the morning uh, because they don't eat as much overnight uh, as they eat during the day. So if you do them in the late afternoon, they often end up with quite a, a stomach full of food and then they can regurgitate. Um, but it actually really, it's very rare to actually end up with a problem with them regurgitating. Interestingly in that one, we did a bilateral, um, bilateral tusk extraction, which means we have to actually roll the animal over halfway through the procedure. And if you've done horses or any large animals, you know that um, if they've been lying down on one side for a long period of time, you get uh, the, the bottom lung becomes completely consolidated. And then when you flip them over, they end up um, actually drowning, basically. They, they, the, the bottom, you know, they, they can suffocate. Um, so that would be a real problem. But it's interesting, in elephants, that doesn't really happen because they don't have the pleural space. The, the lung is actually attached to the thoracic wall. And um, so uh, in uh, Taronga, we, we um, took some blood gases from them before we rolled the elephant over and then rolled him over. 
and then took some blood gases um, again to just check what the oxygenation levels, and they were actually better after we'd rolled them over. So interesting, just in the differences in anatomy, um, you know, make quite a difference. If you try to do that with a rhino, uh, you'd probably kill it the moment you turned it over. Okay, so you, then you would have to structure it as two different procedures, um, unless, you know, again, in a small animal, not too, too bad, but trying to work flat on the ground, um, doing a tusk extraction, really, really difficult to do. You know, so, and then standing sedations, um, I know that some people have tried standing sedations to do on elephants. I mean, I did one a couple of weeks ago, and that's fine, but to do a tusk extraction, you know, working up, up into a tusk like that, really almost impossible. So, yeah, and then we've done some hippos too. Um, had some scary experiences with hippos. They, they're pretty much uh, a nightmare to work on. Um, basically because they are aquatic animals, they don't have any peripheral veins or arteries, so you, and to try and even know that they're alive whilst they're anesthetized, they breathe once every two or three minutes. You know, so uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, they could be dead <laughs> halfway through and you actually don't know. And you cannot, I mean, if you put a stethoscope on the chest of a hippo, it's very difficult to actually hear anything. Um, so we normally try and connect them up to an ECG machine. It's the only way that we actually know that they're still alive, sometimes during the anesthesia. Um, but they're also obviously very dangerous animals, and if they wake up during the procedure, um, you know, it, it can be quite a nightmare. And, and then obviously I have to work in, you know, well, my colleague um, Gerard has to work in the mouth of, the, of all places. You know, so it's, it's not as if we have to do a little stitch up somewhere else on the, the back end of the body, you know, away from the sharp end. Um, we've always got a bit of a challenge. Um, seals, I, I, so all the aquatic mammals, this is fascinating in terms of the, just the responses to anesthetics, the, the whole dive reflex and responses that they have, um, the way in which they manage oxygen in the body. Um, it's fascinating to me, so I've done quite a bit of work on, on Cape fur seals. Um, so all of these, they're very similar in terms of the anesthetic to the hippos uh, in how they respond and um, how we manage them. So. Um, really had a, you know, quite a lot of experience with them. And then rhinos, I try to stay away from rhinos now, um, a lot of politics involved with them. Um, but we've done quite a bit of uh, you know, work on, on rhino anesthesia as well, and some of these very, very horrible cases where the animals have been mutilated but are still alive, um, had their horns removed. Um, sometimes these are darted with veterinary drugs. Horn is taken off and they're left like that mutilated and um, I don't know, I think, uh, to be honest, now I have the feeling that I would probably euthanize these cases right from the start rather than pushing through, but we have managed to uh, treat them. It takes months and months, multiple anesthetics to, to go to get to a point where that is healed. Um, it's basically half the face cut off, and it's really, uh, you know, absolutely awful. So fortunately, we haven't had one of these in a long time. It's actually been, you know, um, much, much better of late. And then, then I started... You know, it was presented, I mean, I do remember the moment that somebody said to me, you know, well, Harat said to me, why don't you do your PhD on cheetahs? And I, you know, I kind of thought to him at the, at the time, said to him at the time, are you mad? Spotted cats, do you know what the politics is like with, with spotted cats? You know, and everybody's got an opinion about them. But they certainly proved to be the big challenge because, um, as I'll explain to you in the next sort of lecture, they are, um, they have so many problems um, in captivity. And... Most of those problems are um, completely unexplained. You know, we don't have real a good idea. And that, for me, was then presented me with this big challenge. Okay, how can I try and understand that problem? And um, I think it was just too tempting. So that's eventually what I did my PhD on. Um, worked a, a lot up, uh, in Namibia at Africa at the Africa Foundation, where I collected most of the samples. Uh, for my PhD and then um, really try to understand them from a basic biology point of view. So uh, my PhD was on metabolomics, um, sort of systems biology, and trying to understand the whole physiological system of it, what is a cheetah. And that's thrown up so many, many interesting uh, questions, which uh, I'll obviously share with you um, through the next uh, day or two. Um, they obviously have um, really bad gastritis, which we're going to talk about, and we did quite a lot of work there. Okay, and then on nutrition, did some work on, on quite a lot of lions as well. We have a fairly large captive uh, population of lions in South Africa, um, which uh, unfortunately many of them are involved, uh, were involved, um, probably not so much anymore in the hunting industry. Um, but that presented us with a fairly large uh, number of animals in which to get some um, research samples on. And then uh, we also have quite a lot of leopards. This is a wild leopard up in the Soapansburg that is caught in a foothold trap. 
and um, for a research project for coloring. So done quite a work, bit of work on that. And then the rhino, just coming back to them, um, one of the challenges we have with them is anesthetizing them. And um, they, unlike elephants, I mean, respond very badly to some of our opioid drugs. And one of the things that we get with them is very high blood pressures in the actual lungs. And the, the pulmonary pressures are incredibly high. Um, and so we, we had the challenge of how are we going to measure the pulmonary blood pressure in, in a rhino? Um, now, normally in a human, if they want to do that, they, they pass what they call the Swan's Gans um, catheter up through your femur, femoral um, uh, vein, up through your heart, through, goes through the heart with a little balloon on the end, it floats with the blood flow through into the actually pulmonary artery, and then they can measure the, the pulmonary pressure there. Now, in a rhino, that was going to be a bit of a challenge. First of all, because we had to have a specially made two meter long Swan Gans uh, catheter that was made in Scotland for us. And then the second problem was that um, obviously the femoral vein is not going to be an option, it's too far away. But the other problem was the jugular is in a, in a rhino is about 12 centimeters below the skin, surface of the skin. So it's not easily accessible. And so what I had to do was to try and find another accessible vein, and I found one here on the, on the, on the jaw of the rhino, which is only four centimeters below the, the surface of the skin. And um, we had to get, get the catheter in within, in order to be able to do this research, get it in within 15 minutes, um, have everything set up, ready to start collecting the data uh, from that. Any, where we managed to do that with a colleague of mine, Professor Leith Mayer, and um, so we described the technique, uh, and it, it's really some high-tech stuff that we've been doing in, in rhinos. This was all done in the Kruger National Park. Um, okay, and then just the last few things, I've done some work on uh, other things with primates, I enjoy uh, working on, on wild primates as too. This was um, down in an area in South Africa called Hogsback, uh, where we were studying a group of um, some mango monkeys. Um, that uh, They've had oak trees planted in that area, and they've been there for over 100 years, these oak trees. And um, these mango monkeys uh, love the acorns, um, chewing the acorns and chestnuts. But as you can see, quite a lot of damage that's done to their teeth uh, because of this we're not quite sure whether it's a fallback food or whether they just absolutely love the, the acorns, but obviously has a very big impact on their, uh, on their dental health. And so you get very severe dental wear problems in those animals. Uh, and then I'm going to might mention a bit about great apes and heart disease. Um, have some very uh, different ideas on heart disease in great apes, and we might just mention a little bit on that um, during the next two days. Um, and then the last one... Um, one of my PhD students has been working on bush babies. Uh, on this, we have two different species of bush babies in South Africa. The, the greater one, uh, these two at the bottom over here, and then the lesser uh, bush baby at the top over there. Um, these guys are really interesting because they do this dramatic diet change from summer to winter and the wet season to the dry season. In the dry season, they survive almost entirely on acacia gum. Um, I know you Australians have taken the name acacia anyway. So we, I, don't, I don't even know what they're called in South Africa anymore, but yeah, uh, what was an acacia <laughs> in South Africa. And um, they will eat the gum, which it, it's cellulose. It's, it's a very low uh, energy, low protein um, gum that they have to then digest. And then over into the summer where they have a lot of uh, insects available, and now they suddenly do this switch from this low energy food to high fat, high protein diet. And I wanted to kind of understand how they do that. Um, so um, she'd been working on some of the metabolomics of um, oh. Oh, the bush baby. Uh, this is Otolima crassicordatus. All right, so that's pretty much me. Um, as I said, quite a broad range of stuff, but we're really going to focus in on the carnivores and some of the work that we've done on carnivores now. So I'm going to just um, stop there for a moment and just give you five minutes to, well, let's make it two or three minutes just to stretch your legs quickly and then I'll set up the next talk and then we'll move into some of the serious stuff.